Hello and um, welcome to this uh, session that is moderated by the BBC and the BBC World Service. It is an absolute privilege to be here and to be with this panel. My name is Liliane Landor and I am the director of the World Service uh, and the controller of international services here at the BBC. I want to say first and foremost, thank you to COP26 and uh, to the Africa Resilience Hub for asking us, uh, BBC World Service and One World Media, to chair this session about the challenges of reporting on climate change in Africa. The invite came about because of the BBC's Life 50 Degrees season. Um, that's a season of films looking at how people are having to adapt to extreme heat in more and more places across the world. Now, Life at 50 Degrees was Truly Pan BBC, uh, Pan BBC World Service project. It originated within and was run by BBC News Arabic, and they collaborated with uh, BBC Mundo, the Asia hub of the BBC World Service, World News, World Service Radio, and Current Affairs. And we designed it as a digital first series. Um, we made it available in a multiplicity of languages with digital content of different lengths and sizes. It also, of course, went out on TV. And in fact, yesterday, it was on uh, the main one of the main BBC channels, BBC Two, um, at eight o'clock prime time, and it was an absolute feast to, to uh, watch it. Um, also came out on our TV channels, BBC News Arabic and BBC News Persian. Uh, the, the digital content alone has received so far 16 million views as of last week and is still going uh, strong. So, of course, as director of the World Service, you would expect me to say, would you not, that only the BBC World Service could have made the Life at 50 series. That's exactly what I'm saying, and I'm going to tell you why. Because we have journalists based in every region of the world, many of them in the global south. We have an extraordinary breadth of expertise. We have the most beautiful storytelling skills. And behind all this, the firm commitment of the BBC to cover climate change and the way it's impacting on people's lives. And we cover it with independence, compassion, and rigor. We did our research extensively. Um, and the latest climate data showed that the number of extremely hot days that is above 50 degrees had more than doubled since 1980 and were happening in more parts of the world. And this is why Life at 50 was born. You will see it is, or you would have seen already, a collection of individual stories about climate migration and the resourceful way communities adapt to extreme heat, especially when they have nowhere to go. Uh, we filmed in 10 countries, uh, primarily using local teams. In Africa, we filmed in Zuerat and Chingeti in northern Mauritania, in Kilankwa in central Nigeria, and in the Niger Delta. Uh, the series also included uh, films from the Middle East, South Asia, the Americas, and Australia, spanning the globe. Uh, this kind of journalism is risky. Uh, it's risky because the areas where we filmed are classified as hostile environments because of the heat, because of their remoteness, because of conflict, because of risk of kidnapping, um, and various other challenges, uh, including powerful lobbies and interests. And, and the, in, it is most of the time not in their interest to see journalists digging. Well, we dug. Um, it was, a, a, of course, you would tell me that working in these situations is a daily reality for journalists across Africa. And that is precisely what we are here to talk about. Uh, just a quick word on other climate change programs and projects across the BBC. We've had a recent panorama, BBC panorama on extreme weather events that are becoming increasingly uh, commonplace around the world from BBC News Africa. We've looked at the challenges 
faced by Gambians producing renewable uh, energy privately, but unable to sell the excess energy they make back to the national grid. We have carried messages from young African climate activists, the leaders at COP26, and we've broadcast a fascinating interview with Sierra Leone's president about the impact of deforestation on his nation. So, that's what we've done, enough of me. I'm going to now hand you over to Mayeni Jones, the BBC West Africa correspondent who will chair this session. I'm going to stay with you for as long as I can, may have to go to a, a, an important meeting, but for now, enjoy, enjoy the session and thank you. Thank you very much, Lilian, uh, for that introduction and welcome uh, to all of you who have tuned in this morning uh, to hear us talk about some of the challenges that Lilian has outlined. Climate change is one of the pressing issues of our generation, and it's more important than ever uh, to report it accurately. But obviously doing this uh, in Africa, as in many other parts of the world, presents many challenges, which I've personally uh, experienced myself as a journalist for the BBC. My name is Mayani Jones. As Lilian mentioned, I'm the BBC's West Africa correspondent, and I'm uh, based out of Lagos, where I am this morning. Um, we have with us this morning a really good uh, panel of experts, people who have various experience of trying to cover climate issues uh, across the continent. And so I'm just going to introduce them uh, one by one. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Aida Diongna. She is the former director of meteorology um, at the Senegalese Met Agency, and she is Senegal's deputy country representative at the Global Green Growth Institute. Um, secondly, we're also going to be speaking uh, to Sophie Mbungwa. She's a freelance environmental journalist and media consultant based in Nairobi. Uh, she produces the Africa Climate Conversations podcast. Uh, we have Fine Face uh, Dunamine. He's one of the producers of uh, one of our Life at 50 Degrees films, uh, the one called Nigeria Burning. Uh, he's also an environmental justice activist and the executive director of the Youths and Environmental Advocacy Center in Port Harcourt in the Niger Delta. Uh, we're going to be speaking to uh, David Injuguna, who works for the BBC's international charity Media Action. Uh, his work focuses on bridging the gap between communities, journalists and scientists when they're communicating and trying to understand climate issues. Um, and our final panelist who will be joining us um, uh, in a pre-recorded uh, video interview is Malcolm Bidali. He's a migrant rights activist um, who formerly worked as a security guard in in Qatar. Uh, he started blogging about migrant workers' rights, uh, including the exposure to dangerous heat ahead of uh, the 2020 FIFA World Cup. In 2021, he was arrested for his blogging um, and he has now left the country. So we'll be hearing a, a fascinating uh, pre-recorded interview with him. So now we're going to start with um, one of our very first uh, Life at 50 films. Um, we're going to show you a cut down of one of those. This one was filmed in Mauritania, where extreme heat is forcing uh, many people to migrate from uh, the desert hinterland to the coastal areas in order to find work and to survive. Zwerat is a remote mining town on the edge of the Sahara. Other local livelihoods are threatened too. Recurring drought means there's fewer plants for animals to graze. Ali, 
Making a living in the desert salt mines of Zwera has become too difficult for Sidi Fadwa. He's leaving for the coastal town of Nuadibu today. Mohammed and his sheep are catching the same train. Zwerat is the starting point for one of the longest trains in the world, up to 2.5 kilometers in length. The Sahara, the desert, the village. So that was one of our Life at 50 Degrees films from uh, Mauritania, where it's just highlighting just some of the issues uh, that many people on the continent are having to face right now due to climate change. Uh, we're going to talk to Aida Djongna um, in Senegal and get a little bit more of an understanding as to what's causing these issues. Um, Aida, uh, perhaps you could start off by briefly just telling us why are we seeing such extreme heat across Africa and what are some of the consequences of these higher temperatures? Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mayani. First of all, let me um, recall one of the key messages of the latest IPCC report uh, on the physical basis of uh, climate changes. I was honored to be one of the lead author so the report say that climate change has already uh, affected every region on earth in multiple ways and the changes we experience will increase with further warming for africa an increase of warming has been noted since the beginning of the 20th century with a higher rate since the mid 20th century. And for Sahel, for the Sahel and the Sahara region, extreme heat is uh, increasing in terms of intensity and frequency as well. We saw also in the film, uh, a sand and dust storm. About sand and dust storm, Unfortunately, there is a limited evidence of trends due to uh, uh, limited data and higher variability across the Sahel and the Sahara region. About uh, migration, this report does not talk about migration, but uh, from my knowledge of the region, uh, past change in precipitation in the 70s and 80s has conducted to vast migration from rural to urban area for people to find work and to survive. Now, with the increase of heat, one of the strategy is also to migrate to coastal regions. 
particular coastal city, but these cities also are facing other effects of climate change, including, including coastal erosion. Are there any African countries either that are leading the way when it comes to dealing with some of these climate issues that you've highlighted? Uh, nearly all uh, African nations have submitted, they, at the policy level, have submitted they nationally contributed, this determine, uh, they, sorry, <laughs> they nationally uh, determined contribution to the Paris Agreement uh, to participate in the effort of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission, even, uh, even uh, if Africa contribute only uh, about uh, uh, 5% of uh, the total emissions. And also uh, there is an ambition for more adaptation, but these ambitions are subject to increased international cooperation in terms of financing and uh, technical uh, and technological transfer. For example, in the Sahel, there is this uh, great initiative called Green Wall, which ambition is to plant trees across uh, the Sahel from the Red Sea to the Atlantic. But also this uh, initiative needs to, to, to take account of the changing of the climate parameters in order to choose the right species uh, to, to plant. Also, there are many other uh, citizen-led initiatives, uh, usually based on nature, that need to be strengthened and, and supported. I'm guessing one of the issues perhaps with um, figuring out what interventions to take to mitigate these climate changes is data. Um, I know personally from reporting in West Africa, the finding reliable data on the climate or on anything really is usually quite tricky. So what's the issue with data collection when it comes to climate uh, in the Sahel and in Africa in general? Yeah, with the um, context of climate change and increase of uh, 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 extreme weather, there is a need for enhanced uh, data across the region. Why there is a decline of observing system across uh, Africa, sometimes due to conflict, sometimes also due to lack of funding mechanism to national weather service, which have the mandate to monitor uh, the, the weather and the climate. Sometimes also data exists, but they are not accessible because they might be in a not readable format or also there might be some restriction to, to access this data. I think what we need to find uh, at sub-regional level, uh, funding mechanisms directed to towers, med services, and in turn, these med services need to have, uh, to get the data available for research and for studies. For example, in the IPCC report, uh, many trends couldn't be uh, uh, sorry, many trends couldn't be highlighted. For example, increase of heavy precipitation in Africa due to lack of, uh, due to lack of, uh, of data across the region. And finally, do you think that any of the financial pledges that have been made in previous COPs and in this COP26 are going to be sufficient to meet? You've highlighted that funding is an issue. So have any of the financial pledges made by wealthier nations to support developing nations, many of which are in the continent, do you think they're going to be enough or what else can be done? Yeah, if, uh, if that is respect, respected, that's going to be enough because 100 billion US dollar per year was a pledge, but until now, this has not been respected. And also there are a lot of discussion going on in regard to Article 6 about carbon market um, uh, instrument and the, the, the necessity for African countries to include the uh, adaptation in this um, funding mechanism. If all is agreed, I think there will be enough uh, uh, finance for, for Africa for adapting to climate change. And in one word, are you hopeful that uh, everything is going to come together to make this happen? Yeah, I'm hopeful. I think that uh, things are moving out. There are also other funding mechanisms based on, um, on green growth. And I see also there is um, a concours of uh, uh, different actors 
uh, working together to, to make uh, things happening in regard to financing, in regard to nature based solution. I'm hopeful, yeah. There also an increased um, uh, uh, citizen uh, uh, social movement to have uh, to move uh, forward about climate action. Brilliant, thanks, Aida. Uh, we're going to now move on to our second Life at 50 Degrees film. This one is coming from Nigeria, and it's going to highlight what is causing some of this extreme heat that we've seen in the first film. We're going to be looking at the extractive industry in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, and how that is contributing to extreme temperatures in the region. We're about to go to the flow station. It's my sister blessing. This is my mom. You bless it on the right. This is the load, and we're going to the flow station now. Finally, we are here. Close to the fire because of the the heatness. If I nang mama no pa mama, you always always take off ya. Strong. We kiti ye luwa sa wo kere mo na kona yingya. Ame yingya ala sa wo kere. Ima mama. So when we are going to be able to to a little a a if you kill it, only now. You go up river now, can I have a mumia or gangana? We have finiana. I want Jimmy Jackana. Maybe I did it to talk by did it why. Okay, of separation in a million. No borrower now. I would like to be among the people that came to do something to this weather changing every day. So I got a fish to leave, sir. So that incredible film was produced by Fine Face Dumnamine, apologies for the pronunciation. Um, and he is with us now. Fine Face, I, I know from personal experience that reporting in the Niger Delta is not easy. There's a high kidnapping risk. The oil industry is incredibly powerful there. Can you highlight some of the challenges you faced whilst putting this film together? Yeah, good morning. I thank you for having me. Uh, putting this film together wasn't really easy, challenging, but interesting because it gave me the opportunity to tell the world, tell the people, the situation here and the contribution, contribution we are making to the climate change and the challenges we have. 
So I travel with my team around the states, communities, picking the bits and bits and pieces together, meeting with community people, arranging everything that needed to be done to get the film produced. But then certain persons will think that uh, you are supposed to see almost everybody, which is difficult. And because the oil companies are not ready to let whatever they are doing to go out there, they are always timid when they see you try to talk with them or try to you know, film around their facilities and stuff of that nature. But then I think um, when I explained to them after I was arrested and detained for about two hours, and then uh, they took photo of me, they took my name, asked me what I do. I explained everything to them. I'm a journalist, I'm an advocate. And then they put all together. Maybe they send the information through their network and they got to know the kind of person I am. And within a, a very short while, they came and said they should have to free me immediately to leave. So I was free to go. And then they asked me to come back the next morning. I went, I saw them and they became my friends. And to me, nothing happened because it's part of what we experience when we are on the field trying to film and report because this, the civic space in Nigeria is shrinking and reporting from the Niger Delta region, which is the hub of Nigeria's hydrocarbon is also not an easy thing to go by. But we continue to do that because without people like us on ground, people who don't get to know what we are doing as we do and continue development, advocacy and journalism. Yeah, and we're incredibly grateful for the, the bravery that it takes to just work in the region in general on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, the relationship between journalists and the oil industry in Nigeria has always been complicated. Are you seeing signs of improvements? Do you think things are getting more difficult? What's your assessment? Yeah, assessment is that things are getting worse than how they were before, things are getting more difficult because the eyes of the people are getting to open more. They are getting to know what oil companies are doing and journalists are being more inquisitive and they are trying to report more. The advent of the social media is also a very big threat to them because journalists, before they put together the de their detailed stories, they have shared some information about what has happened in the social media and they become timid. So the space is still very shrinking and the oil companies, the relationship with journalists is not still very good because a lot of the practice here is, is not what is obtained in other parts of the world. And they do not want people to report about that. It took me when I got to La Place once in the United States, I saw that um, flaring from companies, smoke from the production of hydrocarbon is white. For the first time, that was where I saw it. But in the Niger Delta, you have very thick smoke coming from the facilities. And they are contributing to the production of black soot that, we are, that is affecting us here. So, those practices that they put on makes it difficult for them to allow journalists to get close to what they are doing. So the relationship with journalists and the oil companies is still as bad as it was and it's even getting worse than what we have today. Yeah, I once had an experience of um, working in an area that everybody told us had gas flaring every day, but bizarrely the week that we were there reporting uh, all of the flares were turned off. Um, the Nigerian government has said that it's going to end gas flaring by 2030. Um, and the practice is actually illegal here since 1984. Why is it still happening? Our companies are being fined, but why is Nigeria the second uh, biggest committer of gas flaring in the world after Russia? Yeah, the flaring is still happening because the Nigerian governments are not committed to implementing their laws to deal with and punish the oil companies for flaring gas. The reason is very simple. Nigeria's major foreign exchange earner is hydrocarbon, crude oil. And they are not going to go hard on the oil companies to penalize them or shut them down for flaring because if they do so, the Nigerian government will not have money to pay salaries and run the administration. So they are playing a kind of palliative relationship with the oil companies. While they flog them with one in-house, they draw them with the left hand. And that is why it is going on. Since 1984 to date, it's about uh, 36 years since they talk about stopping gas flaring. But the process is still ongoing. And I don't even see it ending in, 1930, in 2030 because there is no infrastructure in place, no commitment on the part of government to drive that process. And there is no master plan as far what the oil companies have decided to put in place as a way of being able to address this issue. I know quite well that we just signed the Petroleum Industry Act into law, and the act also prohibits issues around gas flaring. But then I tell you, mark my word today, 2030 will come and go. The goalposts for the stoppage of gas flaring will also be shifted. I don't see it happening then. So what motivates you then if you're seeing things like flaring, the goalposts for ending it being pushed back? 
you're an activist as well as being a journalist. How is it that you keep going with this work? Yeah, I have to continue pushing because we are from communities. I am from the Niger Delta. We have to continue to tell our stories. Despite the challenges, despite the harsh environment, we have to tell our stories. Because if people like us are not on ground, the people will not get to know what is happening. And what we are doing is community and development journalism. So when we try to tell the world what is happening here, it's a way of solving the problem. But the oil companies don't understand that. Some government officials, including security operatives, don't understand that. But what we are doing is to bring out these issues. They are not in communities with us, so they do not understand what is happening. So when we bring out these things, it's a way of trying to let the world know. We'll continue to push despite threat. I've been arrested severally because of the work I do. I've also been shot at because of the work I do, but we'll continue to do our work as long as we live. But then we are also training some people that we take over from us, but we believe strongly in the fact that uh, we are going to continue to report. We'll never be deterred despite the harsh environment threats. We'll continue to report the issues in our community to bring development for everybody, including the people who are against us for telling the stories that we tell. Thank you very much, Fine Face. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you do. Um, David Injunga, we're actually going to come to you next because you are an expert in trying to communicate, work with communities. Find Face just highlighted, you know, some of the kind of issues when you're working with, with some of the communities affected um, by climate change and by uh, pollution caused by hydrocarbons. Um, maybe we can start off by explaining a little bit uh, about the project that you work on that's called WeatherWise. What is WeatherWise? Um, thank you, Mayani. Um, so WeatherWise was a project that was funded by, you know, uh, the UK aid for us to uh, bring together uh, scientists and uh, journalists for them to be able to work together, what we call co-production, um, so that they're able to co-produce weather content that, you know, um, helps our, our target audience uh, make decisions. Um, so they use weather information to make, you know, practical decisions about their livelihood. So what we found out is that um, initially journalists uh, did, not, did not trust uh, scientists because they thought that the information was too technical. And then on the other hand, uh, climate scientists thought that, you know, uh, journalists take you know, whether information or the, you know, they don't understand probability. And so they don't take the science of probability seriously. And so what you'd find is that they both couldn't work together and the person who would get hurt the most is a community. Um, here, communities don't know what climate change is. What they know is that the weather patterns are changing. Um, they rely on traditional methods to, you know, interpret weather uh, forecasts. And even that is changing for, uh, for the communities because um, farmers need to know when to plant, fishermen need to know when to go out fishing, uh, pastoralists need to know when to move around and where to go for pasture. And so you find that as long as there's this disconnect between the three, between the journalists, the scientists and the community themselves, then uptake of weather information is, so there's no trust between the three of them and uptake of weather information is, is you know, is, is not as it's supposed to be. And so what happened is on our project, we brought the three uh, people together. We brought the journalists so that they're able to understand how uh, weather prediction is done. And we brought, um, you know, uh, the, the, the journalists so that the climate scientists can understand how media works and bringing them to co-produce information and to work together, they were able to produce programs that are timely, that are relevant, and that they give um, our audiences practical information on how, you know, what it means when they say there's a chance of rain, you know, how can they make a decision based on that? So we were just empowering communities on how to use weather information for practical uh, decision making. And do you think the project's been successful in terms of getting some of the communities you work with to trust this scientific-based weather information you're communicating to them? Have you had much success in that respect? Um, I'd say that pro uh, the project was successful. We were able to um, get communities to begin to trust 
And how did we do that? It was not to tell them that, you know, the traditional methods that they were using were wrong, but it was to show them that there is a comparison and there is, you know, you can relate how the traditional weather uh, forecasting and the scientific, they have, you know, the similarities around that. And when they began to see that, oh, you know, this is how it works, we experienced uh, success in that. And mm -hmm. also bringing the journalists and the scientists together to be able to understand how each sector works um, was a great success. I remember one of the journalists saying that he didn't understand how he could talk about the weather for a whole year, uh, the life of the project. So he was like, will I be saying a high of 20 and a low of 30, what does that mean? Uh, so when we talked, uh, we trained them on how they can use the scientists as experts for their programs and how they can now use that information as advisories for the communities instead of just giving them, you know, just it will rain, there's a high chance of rain, but making this information practical. Uh, we experienced that the journalists were able to um, produce content for the life of the project, which was two years. But I strongly believe, uh, Mayeni, that there is still a lot that can be done uh, because changing behavior is not something that you can do in two years. It's something yeah. that what time that you have to keep doing and encouraging the, you know, the three, the community, the journalists, and the scientists to keep working together. Indeed, and very tricky work, but very necessary. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, we're gonna hear from our next panelist. He actually pre-recorded his contribution. His name is Malcolm Bidali. He's a migrant rights activist um, who worked in Qatar and was arrested for writing about some of the ways that are changing to workers there, particularly when it comes to extreme heat and working outdoors. Um, he is uh, talking and advocating on behalf of those migrants, but unfortunately has now had uh, to leave Qatar and sent this video from from East Africa. This is Malcolm Bidali. My name is Malcolm Bidali. I am Kenyan. I used to work in Qatar up until recently. Uh, yeah, as a security guard, migrant worker. I decided to go to Qatar for uh, basically to get a better life. My first time experiencing that kind of heat in Qatar was like you open a furnace and, and, and that and that uh, heat that comes out of it, but it's constant, you know, it makes it harder to work, like definitely. Uh, because you are hot, one, you are sweating, perspiring, you are sometimes having headaches and, and, and you are dehydrated. Here's my story, basically. I witnessed and experienced a couple of uh, things that uh, made me want to raise my voice and uh, you know just speak up on uh, our living conditions and 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 uh, migrant rights you know eventually i got arrested for what i used to write and post uh, on my social media i was arrested detained interrogated uh, charges were leveled against me and I was slapped with a ridiculous fine uh, just for freedom of expression, uh, just trying to uh, tell our stories and, and, and all that, yeah. So I was held for about four weeks, uh, solitary confinement. Uh, yeah, four weeks, definitely four weeks. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be released uh yeah and after paying a hefty fine i was allowed to leave the country and uh yeah that's where we are right now how many people are affected by the heat uh these are mainly construction workers security guards sometimes cleaners gardeners delivery riders it's a whole group of people and it's 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 a lot. Uh, migrant workers make up a lot of, a uh, majority of the population, 80, 90%, uh, depending on like, where you look. Does heat affect migrant workers more than Qataris? Like, uh, definitely. Migrant workers are more vulnerable to the elements 
these are the people who are most likely to be working outside, uh, who have to work outside. They don't have a choice to like go in or, or take a break at a certain time or all those uh, working long hours. Uh, uh, this is pretty well documented. This is not something I'm just conjuring up and all that. Uh, whether a national or a local, like it's different. Like uh, they have a good basically, yeah. Uh, most likely they have the choice, yeah. They have the choice to decide, like, okay, uh, this is enough is enough. But migrant workers don't really have that choice. What measures has Qatar taken to protect workers from the heat? From a certain time, a certain period, like workers are not supposed to work outside. Uh, this is like from 10 to 3 p.m. Uh, and any company that is found in breach of this is uh, penalized, you know, fined and all that. Most companies don't really follow the 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 government uh, decree and in as much as they find them this is Qatar people afford people can afford to pay the fines so it's not really a, a measure it all depends on the employer if the employer is kind uh, decent humane like uh, you have it good if not you know uh, that's the stories you see and hear yeah. So that was uh, Malcolm Bidali, a blogger who uh, wrote about how migrants are impacted by extreme heat in Qatar. Um, our next in Bugwa is a freelance journalist and podcaster. And Sophie, I imagine that you will be familiar with some of the issues that Malcolm has highlighted just in terms of working independently without the support of a big media organization uh, behind us. What are some of the challenges you've encountered as a freelance climate reporter. Thank you, Mayani. Good morning, everyone. Um, one of the biggest challenges as a freelancer, basically, is one of the things that you're not recognized, like, you know, the local journalists, basically, because you don't hear on any TV, people have not heard your name. And, and, and most of the time, like I remember, I've been a freelance for, for the last eight years now. And one of the challenges that I remember when I started was actually organizations. When you introduce yourself and they're like, you know, who are you? And because you're not a local journalist, they do not trust that you're actually supposed to, you know, you're capable of doing or reporting the kind of work that they've actually seen locally until when you make your name. Um, at the beginning is, is challenging for many freelancers, basically. And even over the time, basically, you find... Um, there is trust issues because um, sometimes, many of the time, people think that freelance journalists are people who cannot find work in organizations. And so basically they think it's, you know, you can't be hired by anybody, so you decide to actually go solo. And in most cases, freelance journalists, like I've actually seen a lot of the colleagues that I've actually man, met, met, especially here in Africa, are people who made the decision. We Like I made a decision to basically quit uh, from the work I was doing as a radio technician to actually work with communities and highlight the stories that I felt were not being highlighted or maybe probably I felt like I wanted to be basically more useful go with meet communities every single day and tell their stories and that has been one of the challenge and the other challenge basically you find is working especially with government institutions although I, you know you I've found myself in a situation where you do an interview and then you've recorded everything and and when followed the formal um request to actually uh, get the interview but then the expert says you are not supposed to use that particular interview and I'm supposed to be running I've actually done um, the interview um, I've written an article sent it to my editor and then someone says I, you cannot use that interview and it's one of the challenges and also some of the challenges you find is that accessing local areas you know I, I'm a climate um, an environmental journalist and you find good stories most cases you'll find them in those you know remote areas and uh, if an organization sometimes takes care of, of your logistics, they want to control the um, the edit, the, the copy that you actually, the final copy that you that you actually submit. And that is- so How do you get around that? You know, you need to get to these remote locations because that's mm -hmm. where the story mm -hmm. is. But if yeah. a, a company or a government agency pays for you to go there, they then expect something in return. So how do you maintain your independence in that situation? I have, um, in most cases, like I have worked with different institutions, like when I'm uh, reporting, probably, for example, if I'm doing a story for Climate Home News, we, I will ask my editor 
to be able to provide that particular funding for me to go there. If not, I've actually found myself in a situation whereby I've actually had to cancel stories because then an organization insisted that this is what we want to appear as the final copy. And so I cancel that. As a podcaster, because I've been doing um, podcasting for the last one year now, uh, we signed last year in 2020 in June, um, I've been trying to find grants. And in, in, in when I find grants, when I cannot find grants, I actually just... I uh, find that by myself, and um, especially when it comes to telling solutions stories and comes to climate solution stories, I find that, for example, say, um, I decide I'm going on holiday for a specific um, place, but then I'm, I, I ensure this is a holiday time, yes, but it's a work holiday where I make sure that I, by the time I come back, I have a couple of uh, stories that I need to actually run. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find that in terms of um, finding funding for those stories when you're having to fund them yourself, for example, by working whilst you're on holiday, how easy is it for you to get that funding or is an alternative to try working with major news outlets? Have you worked with any major news outlets as a way to, to fund your work? When I'm reporting, not for the podcast, but uh, for the stories that I like, for example, I actually am a correspondent for the Mail and Guardian, the continent. And so when I'm doing work for them specifically, so that one, they will actually, they, they are the ones who fund. But then again, on this side, I will look into other stories that I can actually run. Uh, on my podcast so basically kind of you know uh, killing uh, two birds with one stones uh, but then again the the challenge when it comes to financing I've, I've actually found grants like one of the different institutions that I've actually uh, worked with um, like for example IWMF but the biggest challenge in Africa is basically uh, getting funding that is for African journalists by the African institutions because I still feel like um we are we keep on waiting for the developed nations to actually have grants organize themselves whereby they actually support journalists and so in most cases i don't know uh, you you will have to be applying for grants that are actually for international um, journalists you know basically that are open, uh, open also for us africans but there's a lot of competition but i feel as if it, africa is developing and we need to start telling our stories and actually mm -hmm. not only telling our stories but basically Africa needs to support its own. Africa needs yeah. to find, you know, you cannot grow, but then again, you do not, you, foreigners cannot keep on funding your journalists to be able to actually tell stories. So you know? we need to take I, charge I like of the there, funding there is, there of those stories. It, it's one of the most difficult things in terms of funding, getting find, funding. And I think it's actually um, a platform that needs to, organization needs to think in terms of how do we make sure that African journalists can be able to actually tell, tell, tell the stories effectively in their own terms, using their own funding. Thank you very much for that, Sophie. I think we might have um, lost Sophie. She seems to have frozen there, but thanks very much for that. I think we're now going to spend the last 10 minutes uh, answering some questions from the audience. Uh, we have one here for Fine Face, um, and it is from Yolanda in Malawi. Uh, she wants to know, is there anything the international, international community, sorry, can do to increase security for journalists on the ground, Fine Face? Yes, definitely there are several things that the international community can do to provide an improved security of journalists and advocates on ground. The first one is to facilitate a process for training and retraining of journalists on security issues in covering stories in challenging environments like Niger Delta and Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Another thing that can also be done is to support journalists to provide home and office security system. It helps to deter and chase away some of these oppressors that attack journalists. Another thing that can be done is to have journalists have some security gadgets that can help them when they are carrying out their activities on the field to be able to record their position, what they are doing, transmit this information to you know, people that get to know should anything happen, they are aware that this is where they were. Another very important thing to do again to improve the security of journalists on ground is to recognize some journalists that are frontline reporters such international recognition by way of award, by way of forum that make people to hear their name, when they come back to report in that environment, those who oppress, we get to know that these people have some local and international recognition. For that reason, we don't have to temper with the people. And those people, when they return, they have to improve the capacity of the people at home to be able to grow to that extent. It is only when we have our profile increased that we can be able to report without molestation and challenges from the security and other oil companies that operate around. 
Thanks, fine face. We have a question uh, for David, and it's from Baba Martin. He works for the Daily Trust, which is a Nigerian newspaper. Uh, he says WeatherWise is a fascinating project. Uh, he says, how do journalists get some of these more complex scientific messages about climate change across to the general public and communities? For example, if they have to do that in foreign languages, how do they get those audiences engaged, David? Um, media really helps in this. It's not easy because there are some scientific terminology that they hasn't been broken down. They, we don't know the local term yet. But what we do is that we try as much as possible to encourage the journalists to use you know, local language, uh, describe if there's no word for it, but use descriptive uh, terminology to help uh, define whatever um, terminology that the scientists are trying to explain. And also have a way where you open, you make it a two-way communication where you're asking the audiences themselves, what do you call this kind of uh, you know, situation in your, in your local language. Um, working with different uh, formats like, you know, radio drama and, uh, you know, discussion programs that allow uh, two-way communication and allow you to discuss and to explain terminologies is also a good way. But we are also working with, an orga with organizations like the um, IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center to break down even our own manuals that we are developing to log Hindi and you know the more common languages, and then maybe someone else can pick it up and break it even uh, down further. But yeah. it's not easy, definitely. No, yeah, you know, working in different languages. Um, I sometimes have to report in French, and uh, trying to get the nuance of the science across is not always easy. Uh, we have a last audience question, and this is open uh, to anyone really. Um, it's from Bumi Adulojo, uh, who works for the cable uh, news website in Nigeria. How can climate reporters effectively manage situations where locals who, you know, may be economically disadvantaged want money in exchange for speaking to journalists or even filming a story in their community? And that's something that we've had to deal with. Um, so perhaps, I don't know, Fine Face, David, Sophie, uh, you haven't answered any audience questions. So maybe, Sophie, uh, what do you do when locals ask you for money? Yeah, interesting, yeah, because I found myself in that situation a lot. And especially when I was, there's a time um, I was doing the mental health series. And it was such a dire situation because then these people for real, they don't have food. Some of them did have shelter. Uh, one of the things I do always is I, I insist that um, I personally, I cannot pay you because then again, it's actually not ethical. Uh, but but it, it's one of the, because I found myself denied a story. Someone says, then you can't talk to me because then again, if you're not going to give me money, then you can't talk to me. But I think it's one of the things that when I'm working with an institution, I'm working with an editor, that is some of the things that we agree on. And I'll tell them, this is what I'm finding on the ground. Uh, what do we do? You know, work closely with them. If they say uh, we can, you can pay them, then it's something that we agree on. But most of the time, I insist very well that I cannot. And sometimes you have them sign a form saying that they've given you this information freely, and then they, or the pictures that you've taken or the videos that you've taken, you can actually use them. But I think it's that point because then sometimes explain to them, I'm actually trying to actually bring your story you know, to air your story so somebody else can actually be able, probably in a position to help, they can be able to help you. Yeah, but there are people and, who are willing to speak without giving, without the money. And fine face, uh, the Niger Delta, despite its abundant oil wealth, has some of the poorest communities in Nigeria. I've seen it myself in Port Harcourt, in Bielsa. I imagine you've had to deal as well with some members of those communities asking for money. How have you dealt with that? Definitely, that is the situation on ground. A lot of people won't talk to you except you give them money. But I always insist, we are not paying for stories because if I give you money for this story, your voice will not go because our editors wouldn't air your story. So we don't pay for story. But sometimes if it's a challenging situation, after the interview would have been concluded, you can support the person with transport back to wherever he or she is coming from. But we don't pay for stories. It's been something we've been hitting on and will never pay for story because if we pay for story to amplify your voice, that means it's not ethical. You should even be thanking us for traveling down to come and take your voice to amplify. So we try to do uh, play around that and we get our stories done. 
I agree. I think it's important to emphasize that having a platform um, is more important than any immediate financial help. But it's incredibly, it's it's very difficult. You're facing somebody who's hungry and you have to tell them that you can't help them. Unfortunately, I, I could talk about all of these issues um, all day, but we're coming to the end of our panel uh, discussion. I just want to thank again all of our contributors for coming in so early in the morning and talking to us and sharing their expertise. We, we can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate uh, your contributions. You're all doing super important work despite all the obstacles that you have highlighted. Working in Africa, it's one of the toughest regions to gather information, reliable information. We've highlighted, you know, lack of data, um, as Ada's pointed out, although, you know, efforts have been made to remedy that, we highlighted security issues, harassment, arrests, um, and we've highlighted, you know, the difficulty of having to communicate some of these very challenging scientific uh, issues with communities who are affected by it and might not believe some of the things that you're communicating. But I think more than ever, it's crucial to continue with this work and to continue highlighting the effect that climate change is having, particularly in Africa. Coastal erosion, desertification, high temperatures are all things that millions of Africans deal with every day. And more, more than ever, they need to get that information from journalists and from activists. So at the BBC, we hope to continue doing that work. We hope that you will all uh, continue doing that work too and support us by tuning in. Um, but thank you very much to all of our audience members for listening to us this morning. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your day.